Break Fix Podcast is all about capturing the living history of people from all over the autosphere, from wrench turners and racers to artists, authors, designers, and everything in between. Our goal is to inspire a new generation of petrol heads that wonder, how did they get that job or become that person? The road to success is paved by all of us because everyone has a story. They started a safe space for F1 fans who felt marginalized in male-dominated spaces to connect, make friends, and discuss races, drivers, team drama, future goals and aspirations, and everything in between. Their specialty is connecting Formula One to pop culture and exploring the lighter, more fun side to the world's most elite motorsport. That's right, Tanya. Kate and Nicole of Two Girls, One Formula podcast fly their fangirl flag loud and proud and are never ashamed to get the label. They understand that you can respect the technical side of the sport and think the drivers are cute too. And they're joining us tonight for a special Break Fix crossover episode. Brad, Tanya, and I want to welcome you both to Break Fix. So how are you doing there, Nicole and Kate? Hi, thank you so Hi. much for having us. We're super excited to be here. Yeah, it's always fun to do a crossover with another show, especially if it's motorsport related. Absolutely. absolutely. So as our listeners know, Tanya and Brad are our resident Formula One subject matter experts because they talk about it on every drive through <laughs> episode since the very first one. There's that expert word again. I was going to say, I can see Tanya rolling her eyes a little bit about <laughs> that. <a> strong <laughs> word. Yeah, Eric, you're setting us up to be shamed on our own show it's very good even if you watch five minutes of f1 you're still more expert than i am in the last true it's five minutes more than you've seen in the last 10 years it's all relative what i'm hearing here is we're all gonna gang up on eric in this episode (laughs) so actually the whole premise of the episode is to convince him why he should watch f1 and i have to tell you using the f1 drivers as cute might get your foot in the door (laughs) it might be a good opening for him Wow. I love that. <laughs> Drive to Survive definitely will not be the way in. I will tell you that right That's now. True. And oh. it is a known fact on this show that I refuse, even though Brad has tried at multiple attempts unsuccessfully to get me to watch Drive to Survive. It's not going to happen. What's the reasoning behind that? Are we going to get into that later? Hard-headed okay. stubbornness, but okay. we can yes. talk more about it. All right. We won't jump the gun on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to unpack that though. Yeah. Yes, for we sure. have to unpack that. <laughs> he just doesn't watch F1 anymore because let's not try to talk about like f1 20 years ago because he'll put us all to shame <laughs> got it absolutely got it okay yes. Yes. setting the scene i'm got I'm, my wheels are turning i'm i'm building the case i'm ready for this <laughs> great 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 we'll stop picking on eric for now we're going to go back to that but let's address the 900 pound cup in the room <laughs> tell us how you all became f1 fans yeah so a little bit of a long story a little bit of a backstory is that i was dating someone in 2015 and he was a huge formula one fan i had never heard of the sport before and i thought that racing cars was pretty dumb. I was like, this is what you choose to spend your time on. Okay, great. Eventually our relationship got pretty serious. We moved in together and my weekends were just dictated by qualifying and when the race was on. So I was like, okay, well, if this is going to be my life now, then I might as well pick a favorite driver and just really get into it because I'm going to have to watch the sport every single weekend. My ex-boyfriend was like one of those people who consumed every single interview. He like watched all of the race highlights, every piece of content. And so I started picking up on the fact that Daniel Ricardo was like one of the more enjoyable humans to watch on the screen. And so I was like, he has the best personality. That's my guy. I'm going to start cheering for him. I have heard it said before by other female fans of Formula One. It's the smile that launched a million fans. (laughs) I believe it. I believe that. You know, I was just, I would watch the press conferences and, you know, Lewis is very serious and you've got Seb and and they take their job seriously, but Danny's up there cracking jokes. And I was like, all right, well, he makes this enjoyable for me. So I'm going to watch for him. I ended up going to my first race, which was Montreal 2017, 2016. That was kind of when it clicked for me and I was like, I get it. Being there, hearing the cars in person, like seeing all of the people who came from all around the world, the sense of community was incredible. It was just a really fun environment. And so that kind of clicked for me. And I was like, all right, 
I'm in it. So Montreal was my first race. Then I got to go to Silverstone and then Kate and I lived next door to each other. So her and her boyfriend at the time, now fiance, lived next door to my boyfriend and I in South Boston. And we were basically just like, come over watch the race with us. We like to spend time together anyway, and we want more people involved to like come over and hang out. And so Kate will take over the story now. Yeah. So Nick and I started getting into it just because we would hang out with Nicole and Alex. And at first I was like, "Mm, this is really just an excuse for me to hang out with my friends. And like, I don't really care what's happening on the TV. Like if you're going to feed me and also make me cocktails at 8 a.m., I will be there and I don't care about anything else. I mean, we were just there and Alex and Nicole were so into it that it was hard not to be on our end. And my fiance is huge into sports. So this was just like another sport for him to love. So did you have like a cool name for it? Like brunching with Botus? (laughs) (laughs) I wish. No, it was just Sunday brunch. Yeah, it was just. Well, it was like our Sunday couple friends day. Yeah, Uh, we had like. Yeah. So we would just like would watch the races in the morning and then hang out the rest of the day and like go get food and do whatever. We got really into it. And then I think this was what 2018, Nicole. Yeah. Was like when we first were getting into it, because I remember one of the first races I ever watched Kimmy won yeah it was austin 2018 yeah and he won and i was just obsessed with him i was like this dude doesn't care he doesn't care that he just won no emotion was just like awesome and i was like i love his vibe i love this (laughs) man's vibe i love him now he's my favorite after that is when drive to survive came out and so we got a chance to like dive a little deeper into it and get to know the players a little bit better and team principals and the drivers and kind of everyone involved which sealed the deal for us and then I'll pass back to Nicole for the, the remaining the part kicker. of the story. Before we pass it to Nicole, did you stick with Kimmy into his NASCAR era, I guess, a, a couple of months ago? We really wanted to go to Watkins Glen. I don't remember why we couldn't, Nicole. I think but... you had a bachelorette party. Ugh, you're right. I had like, <laughs> I had seven weddings this year and I was in a oh few of God. them and had bachelorette parties and every single weekend for the past like five months has been taken up. So we did want to go see Kimmy, mostly because I like wanted to see him but i also really wanted to see his family because mm-hmm. mintu and the little ice cubes they're just the best and so <laughs> i was like if they're gonna be there i have to be there so unfortunately i was not there but i wish i was so i just want to clarify for the audience nicole you were actually sort of physically involved with formula one before drive to survive yes and then kate came about it sort of through you guys the fandom and drive to survive and then went to your first kind of in-person race after that. So it's a bit of a, you know, one side or the other. Okay, cool. Right. Yeah. And so then my boyfriend at the time and I went to Monza and I was thoroughly convinced we were getting engaged. I know Kate was also convinced we were getting engaged. Plot twist, we break up. He has been cheating on me and we break up Mm. the night before the Grand Prix. So I'm like, well, I'm still going to go to the Grand Prix because tickets are expensive and we're here now. And so obviously I didn't really enjoy my time in Monza. I did see Charles Leclerc's last win at the time. Obviously he went through a dry streak. So I felt we were kind of cursed together. So (laughs) after that, I came back and rightfully so I couldn't really watch Formula One because my heart was broken. And so I kind of distanced myself from it a little bit. And then come 2020 season, obviously we have the COVID situation, everything shut down. Kate basically came to me and she was like, Hey, I miss watching Formula One with you. Can we reclaim this and like make it our thing instead? Like, let's go back to doing brunches. I think it'd be really fun if we did themed brunches around this. And I was like, absolutely. I'm ready to get back on the horse. That summer when in 2020, when they were like, all right, we finally have gotten it together. We're going to start racing again. Kate and I were like, all right, well, we send each other so much Formula One content back and forth together. We might as well just start an Instagram page for it so that we can separate our main feed and not bother all of our friends with this Formula One content. (laughs) Let's just find like-minded individuals through our dedicated Instagram, which is kind of where Two Girls, One Formula came into play. It started basically because we were just working together out of my kitchen and Kate turns to me and she goes, how funny would it be if we had a blog called Two Girls, One Formula? And I said, I'm buying the domain right now. And that was the end of that conversation. We literally (laughs) didn't think about it at all. Yeah, we may or may not have shot ourselves in the foot with the naming decision that day. 
but it's stuck. And that's what we're here with now. <laughs> it's definitely unforgettable. I will say and that. so, you know, our, our thought process around that is obviously that was a cultural moment. However you view it, everyone knows the reference, especially if you're in a certain age group. And so we aim to be that viral moment within Formula One and just make sure that no one can forget who we are. We're going to pause here for a second for our first pit stop question. And this one's coming out of left field, because if you do follow the Two Girls One Formula Instagram, there's something very apparent outside of all the memes and the shirtless guys and everything else is the discrepancy in your guy's height, which makes you guys very similar to me and Brad. So <laughs> Nicole, how tall are you? I am 5'9". Ah, so Kate, then how short are you? <laughs> uh, I am 5'1 and a quarter. There it is. Okay. And a quarter. <laughs> it's a, a quarter very important, important quarter. quarter. Yeah. yeah. It is. <laughs> Not how short she is, it's how less tall she is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, because Brad tends to tower over everybody in our organization. So I, I feel you there. You know, scrolling through your guys' Instagram, <laughs> it's full of all sorts of interesting stuff. So very cool. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the whole point of Two Girls was also a little bit of spite for my ex-boyfriend was that well, I wanted to be so ingrained in this sport that he really wouldn't be able to escape my success. So it started as a little bit of a revenge plot, but it has grown into something <laughs> so much more beautiful and really impactful for the Formula One and, and motorsport community. I have to thank him for breaking my heart because without it, we would not have two girls one formula today you know for people who want more on that backstory catch you know their first episode essentially <laughs> yep. and there's even more to hear about this somewhat traumatic monza <laughs> event there, there, there's a little, little italian lady with an umbrella there's a whole thing going on with that <laughs> that was a beautiful moment i like that it was it really it really was and for context for anyone who's listening there was a moment it was very theatrical american in paris sort of yeah ex exactly yeah. <laughs> i'm sitting at the bus stop waiting for my now ex-boyfriend to go figure out how we're getting from the train station to the track it's pouring rain. My jacket is not waterproof. It's just water resistant. I'm soaked through. I don't have an umbrella. I'm waiting at the local bus stop. You're crying. I'm crying. This woman just comes up to me and she just like doesn't speak a lick of English. She just stands next to me and holds her umbrella over me. And I was just like, this is one of those like humanity is really good moments. <laughs> and so I think about her often. <laughs> any plans to return to get your vindication as you said yes we definitely need to reclaim monza we're thinking we're hoping to do next year nice. the monza grand prix just to reclaim it are you gonna stop by that bus stop <sighs> i mean it's right I outside think we have to it's right outside the train station in monza where you take it if you're coming from milan and so it's hard to miss so i will definitely be passing by and saying a little prayer <laughs> yeah, you should take your own umbrella in case it's raining and then you're you should so right. pay it forward you're to the next yeah you the next have to hold it over someone there. else <laughs> you're so right i'll just leave it there for the next person too. with a little note saying yeah. thank you yeah exactly <laughs> Come on, yeah since you guys are in the podcast biz as well take us through the difference between episode one as we've sort of been highlighting hmm. here to your 50th episode congratulations by the way thank, thank you and here's to 50 more so what have you learned 50 episodes later a lot but also not that much <laughs> you know it's funny i haven't really listened to our first episodes in a long time because they just kind of make me cringe <laughs> because we literally had no idea what we were doing we had no scripts no agenda no like anything we just would get I mean the first three episodes that we recorded we recorded them all within a week at Nicole's apartment in Brooklyn I went there some of them we were just like laying in her bed <laughs> right here in this in this room yeah in that room <laughs> we were just laying there recording I don't even know what we were talking we had like grand plans we're like the first episode is gonna be about us and the second one is gonna be all about f1 and the third one is gonna be all about the people you need to know and it was just chaos and they're really funny I need to go back and listen to them to be fair we 
literally we're like, who knows how many of these episodes we're going to do. A couple of people had asked us to start a podcast and we said, all right, fuck it. We'll do a podcast. And so we like bought yeah. mics. We weren't sure what equipment we $15 needed. $15 <laughs> off Amazon. And we're like, we're just using our computers, these crappy mics. We'll see what happens. And I mean, I like to think that in the past 50 episodes, we have kind of found our voice and our niche and exactly kind of what people care about the ways to talk about things that are interesting, but still educational enough that people know what's going on. We still don't totally do agendas. (laughs) We're working on it. We're really trying. We do have like a shared notes app that we will like pop things in and we try to organize it, but it it doesn't totally work. But I think we're trying to learn how to do like segments and like segment our thoughts. I mean, the thing that I think people like about the podcast for us is that it's very much just a real conversation between the two of us. The conversations that are on our podcast are literally conversations that we have just like every single day on the phone. Like I will just like in the middle of the day, FaceTime Nicole, just because like I am bored and we'll just like talk. And afterwards, we'll just be like, that should have been a podcast episode. Like that was funny. (laughs) Uh, So it's just like, that's just kind of how it feels. So in some ways, I'm like, I don't think we've learned too, too much because we haven't really tried to be anything that we weren't when we started the podcast. But I do think hopefully we're a little better. I think we're a little better at editing. I think yeah. Nicole has really honed her skills in Thank editing you. the podcast um, <laughs> because we used to only get comments like, your sound quality is so bad. <laughs> well, I think there was one of the episodes where you guys were like, you should really listen to this in like 2X. And I'm like, what? I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, all right. But I will say that it's kind of funny how when we all get started, we sort of have a similar story. I bought the cheapest thing I could find at Walmart yeah. <laughs> or on Amazon. And we just threw it up against the wall and, and saw what stuck. Right. And, and the same thing, Brad used to always say, you know, it's kind of BSing in the basement. And <laughs> I think we all apologize for our first season. Right? We're kind yeah. of like, yeah, it wasn't great, but you know, <laughs> it got me to where I am today. I will say Tanya pointed out as we were all reviewing and, and following your show that there has been a big transition. You can see it. The show has matured quickly in 50 episodes. So you guys are definitely on the right track. And we're really curious to see, you know, how that perpetuates. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One of my favorite episodes was the road trip. One of the most recent ones, the, the road trip from Dallas to, to Austin. The, the sound quality was great on that one. I'm sorry the mic didn't stick to the steering wheel for oh you. Oh my! That, <laughs> that was probably the funniest thing that's ever happened. We were so proud. We're like, this is perfect. Like I had it in the steering wheel, like perfectly hooked up, and then immediately had to back up and like back out of my parking and, like, spot. So I had to like turn the wheel. <laughs> so the, the microphone is like spinning and the cord is pulling and the laptop is moving. We're like, this is a disaster. I think the road trip episode is a perfect like encapsulation of our brand a little bit where it's mm-hmm. just kind of like we're getting the authentic us and I, you know, people were comment giving like replying to us and they were like, this has been my favorite episode episode yet because it's just so chaotic <laughs> did you guys have like a camera hooked up watching you guys it would have been funny to see nick in the back seat <laughs> no we <laughs> should have we had grand plans to like GoPro and like do all of this and then we just never got our shit together in time to like do it yeah i mean we were listening just like murder podcasts the whole time and just like <laughs> singing musicals like that's that was the vibe like i wish we had a camera because People have been like, that's what you guys are doing. I'm, I was just like driving one hand, holding a microphone. Like anyone that drove by us was definitely like, what's happening in that car? It was, Nick was just laying across the back seat. It, yeah. it was two girls, one car. I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. it really was. It was fun. And I think, you know, we've learned a lot. We've had the opportunity to have a handful of guests on the podcast. And so I think we've also learned how to be better interviewers and like how to pick guests who are going to be like enticing and interesting for our audience members. We're continuing to grow and and learn in this space, just like you guys probably are as well. Now you guys live apart. You guys used to be, you know, next door neighbors, right? So could get together, do your brunches, your lunches, your late afternoon, maybe even (laughs) middle of the morning, 2am, depending (laughs) where the race was being held. What are uh, some food tips for people if they want to hold a little F1 brunch? Did you guys have like actual themes per race or was it like it's Brazil? So we've got something Brazilian. It's Italy. We're getting pizza. Yeah, it started out pretty simple where we would just we would say, OK, race is in Russia. So like, let's look up what 
people in Russia usually have for brunch and we're going to make it. And then you nice. ordered something else, right? <laughs> no, we made them. We and- did. We had white Russians at 7 a.m. Uh, that may- hey, <laughs> like, dude. Brad's listening now. You got his attention. You have my attention. That is the drink of choice. Yes. Because this all happened like when the pandemic first kicked off. And so I was living actually here on the Cape. My parents live here and I live on their property now, but we were here living with my parents for a while. And Nicole basically came and lived with us too. Much to the chagrin of my parents, we would be up at like the crack of dawn, just making the most random foods that everyone was like, (laughs) what is this? One of them, I forget what it was from. I think it was like Azerbaijan. It was the the sweet vermicelli. The noodles. yeah, yeah. You yeah. you knew exactly where I was going. <laughs> it was like noodles that were like coated in cinnamon sugar with an omelet on top. Yeah, delicious, but so strange. And we'd be like, surprise, everyone! We made brunch. This is your breakfast, and everyone's like, what? are you serving us (laughs) so that was really fun you know over time we kind of formalized it and figured out a better way to do it so now on our instagram page every tuesday before a race weekend we will post a menu with some like traditional foods but accessible foods so nothing that's going to be like you can only make this if you're in brazil country just like things that like you can pretty easily adapt and hopefully you have most of the things in your pantry if not like most grocery stores will have them around the world so we'll do like some snacks and appetizers some main courses and at least one drink that's like kind of traditional to that country and then we'll also share some facts about the track and the race itself and then the country that they're racing in just so people can kind of eat the food but also appreciate the culture and hopefully learn something so yeah if anyone's looking to do a brunch watch long party and cook something we have got you covered with menus for every single race yeah and we're lucky enough to have an audience from around the world and so we'll ask for advice from people who live in those countries what is something traditional that you think we should include in the menu and so we oftentimes get a lot of really good responses from that and so that kind of helps us build our menu as well so have you guys figured out what the actual drivers are eating quinoa and uh, (laughs) lettuce protein bars and that's it they gotta stay lean yeah <laughs> they're not eating anything basically uh Arf. we're good at having all the fun and that's a lot of quinoa to get the calories in i mean <laughs> i wouldn't want to eat a whole bunch of flaming hot nachos before going out on track either so i mean yeah. but you do it anyway <laughs> and a red bull right or no i'm yeah. sorry a rich energy or haribo gummy bears you gotta have a rich energy <laughs> Yeah, we're, ri- we're a rich energy family over here. Our diet is very simple here. It's Monster, Fig Newtons, and Haribo gummy bears. So. Okay. Ooh, I mean, the three major one. food groups. That's all you yeah. need. You got to add the Jaeger when the track goes cold. <laughs> yes. After the checkered flag, you add the Jaeger. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah. So brunches, you know, kind of whatever. And Kate and I used to do it together. Now, sometimes we trade off, like Kate has mentioned, she's been very, very busy in a lot of weddings. So I also (laughs) uh, have a deep passion for cooking. So more often than not, I'm the one who's cooking. She's way better. She's way better at cooking than I am. So, you know, I'll just, I'll take the opportunity to do that. And since Kate and her fiance live on the Cape, they don't have as many people around so sometimes i'll make a really big spread and invite a bunch of people over nice to enjoy the spread and to also convince them that they need to start watching formula one as well so it's a little bit of a trap you're an evangelist (laughs) that way exactly so if i can get you up and adam by 9 a.m for food at my home then you're trapped here and you have to watch the race all right so second pit stop question do you guys have a bucket list of any car any track you want to see or be at your ultimate f1 race what is it a i'm not super knowledgeable on a variety of cars i know names and that's basically it and i'm also not very good at historical like versions of the f1 cars i can't say that i have like a dream car but i would love if the nuremberg ring came back because that is one that i am dying to go to so maybe if there is another series going on there i'll make my way over there to go see it just because i think it's a beautiful beautiful track i would love to go to suzuka and singapore 
I think those are the two that I would just like love to go to. I think they're so fun. Like I would love to see Singapore like th- at night. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just such a cool city. And I love the vibe that F1 brings to cities. And I think that at Singapore would be crazy. And I just think Suzuka is so fun. And those are the two I think that are the most bucket list because I think they'll probably be the hardest ones for me to get myself to. I've got a photo somewhere of a part of the Singapore track from my hotel room when I was there a number of years ago. Cool. Like you, could, you could just see like, oh, the bumpers and like it disappeared under whatever, like bleachers to the soccer stadium or something. Cool. So it so was pretty cool. cool to see that. You'll have to find it and, and shoot us an email with it. I'll have to dig deep for it. <laughs> Brad and I want to do uh, dueling GTIs at Yas Marina. So it's mm, a whole, yes. whole different okay. experience. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> As I mentioned at the top of the conversation, I have yet to watch a single moment of Drive to Survive, but you guys are both fans and you've been to races in real life. So let's do a little bit of this versus that. Drive to Survive versus IRL or in Ooh, real life. What do you perfect. guys think? Okay, so here's the thing. I know Drive to Survive gets a bad rep. People who have watched it before get angry that there's so many Drive to Survive fans. However, as someone who didn't have anyone in their life who watched it before, I just had my boyfriend and I, and I was desperate for my friends to be a part of this. I am grateful that Drive to Survive came around because it welcomed so many new people into a sport that is historically kind of tricky to get into. There's a lot of terminology that you can't pick up right away, especially if you're not in tune with car culture at all. It's very technical. You're kind of thinking, especially as an American fan, what do we have? We have NASCAR, we have IndyCar, and barely anyone knows about IndyCar. Well, now they do, but I feel like prior to that, it was like just NASCAR. So you're like, okay, they're going around in circles, whatever. You know, to have this show be an accessible way for so many of my friends and loved ones to be like, okay, like I understand the appeal of this. I'll wake up with you at 7 a.m., to watch this sport. So for us, we're like, great. I love that this is a tool in my toolkit to convince people to want to be fans of this sport. Do I think that you should also get your ass to a a real race? Absolutely. Because like I said earlier, that was kind of the moment for me where it clicked. Hearing the cars, feeling the environment, seeing the drivers in real life is just like taken from your screen and you really get to experience that. Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone has the ability to go to a race they're getting more and more expensive and you know some of them are in the far reaches of the globe and so i think drive to survive is a great way for people to connect with the sport in america we love stories and we Mm -hmm. love tv and we love rooting for an underdog we like to get to know people's stories like i mean that's why reality tv is so huge like we like to know everything about people and about things that we care about. And so I think Drive to Survive kind of hit the nail on the head in order to get American fans involved and invested because you can watch races and you can watch press conferences and you can be like, oh, like so-and-so does this a lot. And like, I know this person, but to have Drive to Survive kind of going behind the curtains, even if it is a bit contrived, it's obviously not fully real conversations, but I don't think they're fake. Like I think Mm -hmm. the situations are real and maybe it's just like, oh, we're going to film you guys talking about this. So you're not going to have like a totally natural conversation to be able to have that, to be able to get to know different people involved in the sport is huge for people to get invested and choose someone to care about because you can see their personality a little bit more. Like Nicole said, a great educational tool for people that have no preconceptions about what this is. I personally have been trying to get more into other motorsports since, you know, loving F1. And I really want to get into MotoGP. Like I want to be like a huge fan of MotoGP so badly. For those that don't know what that is, that's the Formula One of motorcycle racing motorcycles Mm -hmm. yes i want to be a big fan of motor gp really bad i think the athletes there are so cool and so fun and like are a little bit more like personality and spirited than f1 drivers like they just feel like they have such huge personalities because they've got much huger balls yeah exactly (laughs) yeah they're like oh i just broke the entire right side of my body but like i'll be back in a three weeks and i'm like that's crazy to me so does this play into the whole you know hemsworth when he was playing james hunt and the quote from rush where he's like women are attracted to race car drivers because they're so close to death so do, do the motorcycle guys like Maybe. take it to the next level like they're even i think hotter? they do 
Because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and let me tell you, they work out to be able to have that core strength. <laughs> but for me, I was like, I'm watching the races. And I tried to just like dive in and be and like follow people on Instagram and watch the races. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on. And things are happening so fast. The announcers are talking so fast. I don't really know what's going on. Amazon Prime did a series on MotoGP that was very similar to Drive to Survive. It was awesome for me to be able to watch that and like get to know who the different riders are and who the different teams are and kind of the dynamics between them and how things work and like what is big drama there and like what is something to watch out for and like if that happens like that's not normal or like if someone falls off a bike that's pretty normal in a race where like in F1 I feel like if there's a really big crash that doesn't happen every single race but in MotoGP it's like it's pretty common I feel like we just like canceling Haas all together I mean, we're going to get to that later, but there's literally a wreck every race. They they wreck before the race, though. I was going to say, with that Latifi. Yeah. Semantics now. I see what we're doing. I but see what we're doing. at the same time, in F1, if there's a big crash, it, like, halts the race yeah you i mean their safety cars with moto gp they're just sliding off the track and they're just kind of <laughs> you're good <laughs> because it's not like a huge car with like things they're just like on their butt sliding across i think that drive to survive has its value in the way the moto gp series had for me that i was able to like get more into it and like understand the ins and outs a little bit better as someone had no knowledge about it before so it's funny you say that because I've also heard the counter argument that there are other sanctioning bodies of motorsport that are trying to replicate the drive to survive success formula. One of those being NASCAR. And unfortunately, <laughs> it has failed miserably. Does it have more to do with the personalities or the discipline? Because NASCAR doesn't need a reality TV show. It already it is, is a reality <laughs> TV show. It seems exactly. to embrace its identity. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. What do you mean? They had Ricky Bobby. They had that movie years ago. That was a documentary. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a Days documentary. Of, Days of Thunder too? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think NASCAR has a certain brand that is very different to what Formula One brand is, right? Like Formula One is elite motorsport. It's for super rich people. It's an aspiration to be able to go to these races. Like you see the celebrities, obviously in America, we have an obsession with celebrity culture. Whereas I don't think that that reflects the same as it does in NASCAR, where it's like you're drinking bush light in your cutoff shorts and your sunburn and it's trashy and that's fine. And I think it's great. I'd love to go to a NASCAR that's race and experience that. And that's its charm. Arm, but it's very different. And I think people think about when F1 kind of blew up and they're thinking about the Austin Grand Prix and we think about last year and all of the like crazy, stupid American stuff that they made the F1 drivers do and the rest of the world was like, look at the Americans and like, look at how dumb they look with our elite motorsport. I think a lot of people just considered F1 to be similar to NASCAR and that's kind of why they didn't consider it a fun yeah. sport. But now they see that it's different. Yeah. But I think F1 is the gateway drug into other motorsports. And we've seen that with our community and that so many people come in through Drive to Survive through F1, but then are like, okay, I'm interested in IndyCar. I'm interested in the feeder series. I'm interested in yeah. MotoGP. And so like our Discord has channels for basically all types of motorsport yeah. because they're eager to learn because they're yeah. interested in Formula One. So I'm definitely picking up on that. And I can can honestly admit that I've converted a lot of people to multi-class endurance racing mm -hmm. because these were like diehard Formula One people and they watched their first sail in six hours or 12 hours of Sebring or the Rolex 24, mm -hmm. or even Le Mans. I'm like, how did you live this long and not watch one of these yeah. endurance races? But when they watch it, they're like, oh my God, the action and the passing and the strategy and there's all this stuff going on and it's just super chaos. And it's not 90 minutes of a conga line because that's what a right. lot of diehard right. F1 fans are faced with. They're like, wherever you qualified is where you finished. That's part Don't of talk about Alonzo like that. <laughs> you know, hey. so my thing is I can't watch spec racing anymore, right? Yeah. I gave up on Formula One really after the V10 era. Okay. So in the old days, you had a mix of stuff. You could do V8s, you could be six mm -hmm. turbos, you could have six wheel Tyrrells. Mm -hmm. They were at the cutting edge of technology. Now it's like, 
well, there's three chassis builders and three motors and we yeah. debate this all the time. So for me, I see it as, I hate to say kind of boring versus multi-class endurance mm-hmm. racing. You've got Porsche and Ferrari and Corvette and Lotus and whoever, and all these people, it's kind of cool to see them going yeah. at each other. And you can distinctively tell the difference between them. The other thing I kind of take issue with with Drive to Survive, since we're speaking candidly about this, and I don't bring it up too often on the show. But he's never watched. (laughs) It's because maybe I'm a little bit of a purist because Mm. I feel that Drive to Survive ripped off Truth in 24. Because if you look at what Audi, Netflix, and Jason Statham did many years before Drive to Survive came out, it's a condensed version of Drive to Survive. And so it's nothing new, Mm -hmm. but I've also felt like Formula One didn't need this. It's sort of like when we talk Mm -hmm. about celebrities partnering with certain brands and we're like, we didn't need you to tell us that this car manufacturer was cool. It was already cool. Well, here's the thing. I will counter with saying that F1 didn't need that because they did need that because F1 was a failing brand with Bernie and Liberty Media bought it and their stakeholders were like, you got to make money. And they said, we got to expand the American markets. And how can we do that? And they said, Netflix. Exactly. And Netflix brought in all of the money for them. And they turned that frown upside down. And now F1 is a booming company for them. I hope Netflix got a good cut because F1 owes them something. Exactly. So I think the sport was stale. And I think before Liberty came in, social media was not a thing that drivers were really allowed to participate in. They kind of were just Formula One drivers drivers and you didn't know them outside of that and now this whole new version of formula one has kind of come to the surface and so i agree with you i do think that sometimes it's a little bit boring but i think that it's only going to continue to evolve whether or not people agree with this you eric with the purest situation and that i think a lot of decision making is going to go into it to make it and we've even seen with abu dhabi last year with the lewis and max finish that things are going to start to happen for dramatics and to make it more of an exciting sport to watch at maybe the detriment to the driving itself we are used to now having this very you know I think of the bachelor season the most dramatic season yet which is how I think Formula One is like starting to feel that way it's a dangerous line that they need to not cross or it becomes NASCAR right drama they almost crossed it last year at yeah Yeah. the the final race yeah I have mixed feelings about that exactly so you know but if you think okay if that had finished under a yellow flag that that would have been so anticlimactic to a pretty exciting season obviously the way that it finished was shitty and so I think there's still a lot of things that need to be kind of ironed out but it's interesting And to your point, there's no way, I don't think, this many Americans would be on the F1 bandwagon without that show. No, no, no. Because right now, I think there's rumor that the Las Vegas race next year could possibly be bigger, more expensive than Monaco. Oh, I believe it. (laughs) I believe that 100%. And that's Drive to Survive. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Here's my problem. We've gone to some F1 races in person. I still watch them occasionally. Again, I don't subscribe or watch Drive to Survive. But what I take away from that is there's all that hype and the drama and it keeps the excitement going throughout the season. But if you take that away, Formula One is still boring. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like the racing to me is not as exciting as some of the other disciplines like MotoGP, like WEC or IMSA or some of the other ones where there are these real battles and you're rooting for a manufacturer that you can identify. Because if you can tell me the difference between the AlphaTauri, the Red Bull and the Toro Rosso, God bless you. Because to me, it's like watching Spec Miata racing. They're all the same. Well, I'll say this is kind of where we come in. We care deeply about the individuals as well, right. which makes the sport not so boring for us because we're like, we want to know what Pierre's doing the whole yeah. weekend. We want to see what outfits Lewis is wearing to the track because like we care about not just the action on the track. Like we care about everyone involved in the sport as well, which gives us a lot of content to talk about right like we talk about the wives and the girlfriends and we talk about things like peripheral people in the sport like their trainers and like if we were just watching for the racing yeah i'd probably be pretty bored but the fact that we have kind of an emotional investment into the people behind the sport gives more value to the sport as a whole i think it's like priorities and true interests and like Mm -hmm. what you care about the most and like i think that if you're someone that really cares about 
cars and auto manufacturers and evolution in that space, then yeah, Formula One probably right now is super boring because they have cost caps. They have only a certain number of manufacturers. They have all these things that's like, there's not a ton of innovation happening really. So I can see why you might be bored by that. But I think that if you're kind of in it for the lighter side and for the people, then it's not super boring. So I think it's just kind of which way you're looking at the sport from for that. So here's what you have to do, Eric. You only need to watch like the first 10 laps. It's super exciting. You're like, damn Mm -hmm. it, Ferrari's got this. They're going to do it. And then some shit happens and then you're done watching. You can just walk away. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And then maybe the last lap, just in case. Just in case. (laughs) And I can watch that dude on YouTube and that's all I need. He does the funny impressions of everybody. Yes, Connor. Connor. (laughs) Exactly. He's so funny. I'm a little jaded because I grew up in a certain era, the Group B rally era, the Group C prototype era and Formula One at the height of Senna and Prost. There didn't need to be drives to to survive back then. You knew that every event, Prost and Senna were literally like good and evil. They were trying to take each other out all the time. And you could see it in their driving. You could see it in the post session interviews and this stuff. There was just this anger. There was this angst and there was this emotion that was captured without the need of all the drama. But then again, that was the eighties and the nineties and it was a totally different time, right? Yeah. So I, I get it. I get it. But it does kind of lend us into talking about the past. Yeah. So has your increased interest in Formula One in the modern era, have you thought about going back in time and seeing where its origins are from? You know, some vintage F1 and not even just the racing itself, which I know is what Eric would you know, be interested in. But like there's a lot of drama back then as well. I mean, with the Lauda and Hunt and, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and Prost and Senna. I mean, have you gone back and looked at any of that? Yeah. I don't know if you can see I have this photo of James Hunt on my oh, okay. thing here, but we have a friend, Elizabeth Blackstack. I don't know if you are familiar with her. We had a conversation with her. Yeah, so she is a huge vintage F1 fan. She says really solidified for her was Rush seeing Chris Hemsworth play James Hunt was it for her. And so we had her on, we used to stream on Twitch over the summer and she came on and did a whole presentation for us on all of her vintage F1 fits. And we looked at all of the drivers and all of the best outfits from all of the eras. That was really really fun for us. And I think we're starting to explore the more historical side of F1 because obviously we're in it all the time. But as we continue to grow and learn with our community, we're like, okay, well, let's take a step back and like see how we got to where we are today. Leaning into that and learning more about the different eras of the cars is something I think we're looking forward to exploring more during the off season. (laughs) So have you guys caught up on any of the documentaries that are out there on some of the older stuff? Like, okay, you could loosely say Rush, Hunt vs. Loud. Yeah. <laughs> definitely a good film to watch. Like Netflix has got a couple. They've got the Senna documentary mm-hmm. that goes over that. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yep. Yeah. Then there's even the older one. I think it's still out there. The one Manuel Fangio I haven't seen that one. So that's even, either. that's like origin Way story, back. Yeah. essentially. So that'd be another good one if you're looking to... And you know what's really great about the Fangio documentary, which I wrote an article about a couple of years ago when it came out, it debuted right at the beginning of COVID. And one of the things they did in that episode is one of our new favorite pit stop questions, which is goat or goatee (laughs) And so they ask a lot of the drivers, who is the greatest of all time? So I want to pose that question to you guys as well. Whatever you think that definition is, and the answer is not <laughs> Gotifi. Yeah, everybody has an opinion about who the, who the or it could is. be Gotifi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that you all think the Gotifi is quite attractive, and you're, you're so. Really I just, mean, uh, let me tell so you, we cute. saw him in person, and uh, yeah, we saw we saw him, and we're like, so he's he's one of those people that's better looking in person. Yes, yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> well, I have to say, from the images that you all sourced for your Instagram post, they were quite favorable to him I, I was, yeah uh, <laughs> streamer nikki really has got it going on <laughs> unlike what is it dj lando dj little landy little as landy. we call him <laughs> okay to answer the question about who the greatest of all time is i think honestly i'm torn between schumacher and senna just because i think that they had such a cultural impact on the sport you know you bring up michael schumacher to almost anyone and they know that name doesn't matter if they even know that he was a formula one driver like they most certainly like know who that person is and even just looking at his record of being the most winningest f1 driver tied with lewis is really 
I think it for me and Senna obviously was it's a shame that he had to leave us so early because I can only imagine what he would have been able to accomplish and I would also be between two people neither of the two that Nicole just said I (laughs) totally agree with what she just said and I think that like Michael Schumacher is a very obvious like that's probably who's the greatest of all time in, in the sport but for me People like kind of have three, so I'm really not playing, playing game, right? <laughs> Number one, from a long time ago, I would say Nicky Lotta. Like, I love his story. I think that he was an incredible driver, but I also just think he was an incredible mind for Formula One. And I think that he was so talented on the track, but equally, if not more talented off the track in the way that he was able to work on the cars and figure things out and be like, you're doing this wrong and I can make this go faster. Just let me do it. And then and to be able to come back and like have such a long career staying in Formula One, being an advisor, just working with these different teams. And I think it just goes to show like the fact that he was still working with Mercedes when he died is just like yeah a testament to how valuable he was to the sport. My second choice is Kimi Raikkonen, not just because he was my favorite, but I just think he's the GOAT. Like he came in first <laughs> season was just like, what if I just won? everything incredible and then he was like all right i'm gonna fuck off for a couple of years and like try something else just for fun comes back almost completely bankrupt lotus because Mm -hmm. he's so fast they were like we don't really know what to do because we don't have enough money to pay you everything that we promised we would based on how many points you would get then he's just like i don't know maybe i don't want to do this anymore goes on just like continues winning continues being amazing and then just like decides to leave when when he decided to leave and was just like you'll never see me again <laughs> and we basically have it <laughs> he's been like one race but he was like i'm done i'm out of here and he he was a funny person he was a funny like character in the paddock kept to himself always kept it interesting but also didn't like subscribe to the evolution of f1 and was just like i don't do media actually i don't want to do that and i won't be on social media you can try but I'm not giving you anything. And I think he just stuck true to who he was. And so I think he just personality wise, greatest of all time. (laughs) And then my final person that I would put on this list that I think years from now, we will say greatest of all time is Lewis Hamilton. And I think that he's had to do things in this sport that no one before him has ever, ever, ever had Mm -hmm. to do. He's had to overcome so much. And he's also been the biggest star in the time frame of F1, where F1 is global on social media, it's 24 seven, you're not just being looked at through the eyes of a newspaper or a camera crew on the weekends. And you know, people that are there, but you're being looked at by everyone all the time, no matter what you're doing. And I think he's handled it really well and has had incredible results and has kind of always done things with grace. And so I think that in 20 years from now, when we look back and ask people this question, he'll be one of the top names that people yeah. say. I mean, I don't disagree. <laughs> it sounds like you might. <laughs> I mean, just a, just a touch. I mean, Hamilton has had an interesting evolution because if you go back to the early days, especially when he was a young pup and they had him on top gear, you know, a star and a reasonably priced car and things like that. When he was first starting out, he was very different than he is now. Yeah. Right. And they say money changes people and, and fame and celebrity as well and then there was that kind of dark period in the middle of his career where he was like i don't want to talk to anybody he's very standoffish and he was trying to be like senna because senna was very closed he was very reserved Mm -hmm. senna didn't talk a big game he would show up and just kick ass and that's his style but senna is still and i think always will be regarded as like a god and not Mm -hmm. a goat like yeah. he was super human. Oh, you're adding a new category. Okay, oh, 100%. Well, <laughs> 100%. And even somebody like Tanner Faust, who just recently drove Senna's McLaren MP4 on a test day, he got out of the mm-hmm. car. He goes, I don't know how this guy did it. Yeah. He was super human. The thing about Schumacher, to Nicole's point, is that he was always in Senna's shadow. He was studying Senna and he became good. He had a lot of time in the trenches. But what offset Schumacher as not a god? or even a goat, he's like a national treasure. He was adopted by the Italian people, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so he's this like point of national pride and there's just, he's an idol. It's totally different. So he has the merit and the resume to be a goat. Again, I think he's in a different category, just like Fangio's in a different category. Like Lauda and Hunt, 
they got the records and the personality and the panache, but they're not, it's not quite there, right? And there's other names that go there, even Andretti, Fittipaldi and others that are Formula One champions, Mm -hmm. but it's just like, there's these, these other levels. I think Hamilton's almost there. What hurt him is the 10 years that he's been doing this and how much he hasn't stayed the same. Mm. Senna stayed the same. Schumacher stayed the same. Fangio was always Fangio. To your point about Kimi, where Kimmy's Kimmy and he always will be Kimmy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where I, I, I kind of diverge on that, but you're, you're making very valid points across the board. But Hamilton has had to change because of the way the world has changed over the last... And the way he's been over, treated over the by the of his world. Career, he's gone from just like an F1 champion and, and superstar to like a social justice hero for the people that don't have a voice. And he's using his voice for that. And I, you know, so he's using the platform and, you know, Ecclestone's gone. So the collar's off and now people can do what they want. And he's using his platform to try and do good in the world. So that's, he probably would have been doing those things before if he was able to. I'm going to be honest. I didn't love Lewis that much when he was Nico's teammate. I just thought this guy is insufferable. I didn't particularly enjoy his personality. And then he did, I watched that show. Is it Larry David? I'm trying to think. And my next guest is, who is that? David Letterman. David Letterman. I would love, I would love I'm sorry. to see Larry David do sorry. that show. Yes. <laughs> I was like a late night. Lewis. I could not remember David Letterman and my next guest is and Lewis was on it and I watched it and it was kind of a different side to him and I think that was kind of a turning point for him where they were kind of like we're changing your PR and we're like diving deep into like this softer more personal side of you and ever since then I feel like he has been a different person who has been more outspoken about his struggles and other people's struggles to your point Brad about like being a voice for people who don't necessarily have access to the platform that he does. Speaking of insufferable people, uh, Russell, <laughs> his teammate, that's personal opinion. Oh but God, yes, I, I, yeah, I don't like that guy. And he might be the answer to this question, but I doubt it. <laughs> Sexiest F1 driver of all time. Let me tell you, I saw Jensen Button in person in the paddock in Austin, and I was like, yeah, that man is handsome as fuck. He's tall too. And I was just like, yeah, he's top of the list for me right now. But Mark Webber also is really up there too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y- a young Jackie Ix will always do it for me. I'm too busy like choking <laughs> down my laughter over here because I can guess for Tanya who it is. And it's not Ayrton Senna. It's Nigel Mansell. She loves that Tom Selleck <laughs> mustache. Broom mustache. <laughs> well, Kate and I were literally talking earlier today about we need the return of the short shorts. Yes. Uh, <laughs> David Coulthard with that. No. Chin. Yes, the chin. It's the chin. <laughs> it is quite no. impressive. I did walk by him one time, but no. <laughs> I can't say David Coulthard is the sexiest F1 driver. Absolutely I, don't, not. I can't say that in full <laughs> no. confidence. <laughs> but I also will say, young Jackie X, I love him. But also, and I'm going to bring him up again, Kimi Raikkonen, he went <laughs> through a phase when he was younger. He had longer blonde hair that it was sometimes spiked, sometimes not, sometimes just a little bit long. There is one photo of him wearing a white wife beater, tight pants, and a fur I don't know coat. if you can say that, Kate. <laughs> I don't know if we call them that anymore. I don't know what else we call them. <laughs> Tank top? <laughs> It's a wife beater. Sorry. Um, (laughs) I'm not saying character wise, but that's what they're called. (laughs) And it's like the best photo I've ever seen. And he went through a big fashion phase. So he's my favorite. And I think. Yeah. Early 2000s. Kimmy was. You guys got to go back in time. Take a look at Eddie Irvine and Alex Zanardi and Damon Hill and some of those guys. Uh, Damon Hill is. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You asked for the sexiest and I'm answering. I'm surprised you didn't say Leclerc he's beautiful okay I think he's like yeah he's like not sexy though he needs a couple more years to like mature into himself (laughs) yeah I'm like I think he's like too young for me to say that he's like the sexiest his personality ruins it for me though really I, I, I don't like Leclerc as a person all right so <laughs> before a fight starts yeah exactly 
has F1 changed your appreciation of the car hobby? Nicole, you said at the beginning you weren't really interested in cars when this all first came about. So has your opinion changed? A little bit. My ex used to play this game where he would just see a sports car on the street and he would be like, do you think I would be hotter if I drove this car? And I would always be like, no, because I don't care (laughs) about sports cars that much. I still don't particularly care that much. I don't think anytime soon I'm going to get into like rebuilding my own car. But I think that I have learned a lot more about the car hobby. There's so much going on that I simply don't have time to dive too deep into all of this because I will literally not have a life if I do that. You just defined our entire show. (laughs) Yeah, I still have to do other things. And so that's the extent of my car hobby situation. What about you, Kate? Pretty much the same. I've never been super, super into cars. I think I have an appreciation for like nice vintage cars now. Mm -hmm. Like I think like looking at them, I'm like, I can recognize more cars on the street and be like, oh, that's this that's cool. Or like, oh, that looks like an old version of like this kind of car. And like, I know that that's cool. But like, I can't totally tell you why. Nothing crazy. Like I'm like, I can tell that something is like a Corvette. And like, that's pretty easy. (laughs) But I did buy my first car owned a car before but I bought a car by myself for the first time ever this summer. And I did get the sport version. Um, So I feel like I probably wouldn't have done that if I wasn't into F1. I'm not going to ask you what it was. I don't want to embarrass you. you know? Oh, no, it's a cool car. I love it. I'll tell you. It's a Hyundai Tucson 2022, the N line, which is their sport version. <laughs> it has nice red piping around it for Ferrari for me. And it has sports mode that if I want to go, I can click a little button and I'm in sports mode. Plus, you have the DRS. Exactly. Yeah, it's my DRS is enabled. Exactly. It's your encyclopedia of car design is expanding as you continue Mm -hmm. to dive deeper into the hobby. Normally, we would ask people, you know, sexiest car of all time to kind of go in line with our sexiest F1 drivers we were talking about. But I think (laughs) it might be easier to ask you this other fan favorite. What's the ugliest? Car of all time. Kia Soul. Damn, that was fast. That was the first. I think that was the fast. I think that was the fastest. (laughs) No, I just think they're so, so hideous. Like, you're never, ever, ever, ever going to see a normal colored Kia Soul. It is always going to be that pukey lime green. Yeah. Or shit brown. Yeah. Yeah. It's just always the ugliest color. And I'm just like, who's buying these? Like, how did they get you to buy this car? It's so hideous. All I can think about is that when I was looking to buy a car, this summer i test drove one it was this horrible red it was like bright 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 red but it was it was oh my god it had this weird (laughs) shimmer to it i hated it so much and they were like this is the only one of these we have like this car that's like here because there's like no cars anymore because there's import craziness happening i don't know and (laughs) i was like okay i love it but i hate this color and the guy was like well when you're driving it you won't even know that it's red you're like that's not and i was like that's a horrible 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 sales tactic to say to me i'm not i'm not buying this on principle now because you just said that to me but that's how i feel like they get people to buy kia souls they're like you can basically have this for free you just have to know that it's puke green with shit i'll pay you to take this literally they're like please take this from us I think that's a pretty good one. I don't know if I feel as passionately about (laughs) any, I feel more passionately towards colors of cars. And I really hate when people have like burnt orange because I'm like, why would you choose that color out of all of the colors that you could have possibly gotten for a car? It's like the number one color that the Honda Element was sold in. So so ugly. (laughs) So I I think Kia Soul, yeah, I probably, because I just think of the hamster commercial. I'm like, which isn't even a good commercial. Like, how does that help sales? I'm like, you're getting weird hip hop hamster rats. Like, why are we? What's the it's like what are you trying to the say? rapper on PlayStation? Yeah, who, oh. who is the market for that commercial? Yeah, exactly. Clearly, at work, people are still buying Kia Souls today. So, yeah, everybody that surrounds Kate is buying Kia Souls. <laughs> That's because they've been sitting on the lots for so long. There's nothing else to buy. Right there's now. nothing else. I know. I'm like, I'm on Cape Cod, so I'm in like retirement country too. I'm like, this is 
old people bamboo they're, they're just getting swindled into these kia souls it's like a bait and switch <laughs> they were guaranteed one car and then they got delivered a kia soul and they don't know what to do about it so they just keep it i'd know it <laughs> there's no one out there that's willingly buying a kia soul and if you're one of those people please contact me i, I have to talk to you <laughs> it's our next crossover episode we're doing that yeah. one together. <laughs> it's an intervention for anyone who's bought a kia soul <laughs> I need to like talk to the president of the Kia Soul fan club or something. I guarantee you there is one. There is one for yeah. sure. There I'm gonna bring to them. I'm gonna bring them to therapy with me and be like, I need to get to the bottom of your brain. <laughs> okay, so, so so back on topic. As we're closing out the 2022 season, what are some of the best moments, worst moments in in your opinion? Great question. Best outfits, worst outfits. It's so funny because we actually just ran this poll on our Instagram where we were like, over the 2020 yeah. season, what were the best moments? for everyone obviously i think one of the ones that comes to mind is danny arriving in austin on the horse you know i'm gonna really miss so classic. his theatrics <laughs> in the paddock when he's gone thinking about you know one of the most impactful moments for me personally was joe's crash where he flipped over and then basically like slid into the barricades that's right he ended up over the barricade and yeah and, he he flipped sideways over. On the, and then you know. george got out of his car and like ran over and was like trying to call for help and was like didn't leave until someone had gotten there that was that moment was crazy huge moment about like the safety features that had been implemented in the Mm -hmm. sport and just proving that these are necessary and like how life-saving they actually are because he would have been so dead if the halos had not been implemented and so for me that was very cool to see even though the drivers rallied against the halo for so long, I think they're finally like, okay, this has saved people's lives a handful of times. Yeah. I think we can get over it. So yeah. that was a really, really memorable moment from this season. For me, I loved when Charles was leading the championship for a little bit. You know, there was a, <laughs> there was like a month or so uh, <laughs> that he was doing that. And that was huge for me. And also I loved the return of Kevin Magnuson. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, best part of the season was when they said Nikita Mazepin isn't coming back <laughs> that was like number one like no questions about it them saying he's been terminated really did it for me but then them bringing kevin magnuson back i was like oh hey mag and gunther back together getting the gang the band back together it was like really great for me <laughs> and then the second best announcement was latifi leaving <laughs> I mean, we were all waiting. It's time for for him to go. It's time for him to go. It's pretty sad when your backup driver, you know, comes in for your teammate who's out getting appendicitis and scores points. Yeah. 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 So tough. On his maiden F1 race. Exactly. Yeah. You know what? I'm glad that Latifi was in F1 for the sole fact that he kept Williams afloat for a while. And Mm -hmm. they really needed that. Yeah. (laughs) So thank you to Latifi for that. But time to go. Time for you to move on. Yeah. (laughs) And that brings us to it's amazing. Amazing they still exist. So let's talk about the Toad, Haas, and Christian Horner. Let's talk about it. Brad's three favorite things. <laughs> no, he talked about rich energy all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's the difference? One is the again? same. One is oh, the okay. same. We're you know, MoneyGram. We talked about yeah. MoneyGram. All the time. <laughs> Money that's, yeah, that's their new their new sponsor. <laughs> Probably nobody has kind words to say about any of those three. No, here's the thing. I'm actually an advocate for Haas. We love Haas. Here's why, and you'll learn this in Drive to Survive if you watch it, nope. Eric. <laughs> Gunther is a girl boss, okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, Gunther's awesome. Gunther said, I'm going to be a team principal if it's the last thing that I do. And he put his ass into gear and he convinced Gene Haas to buy a team and make him the team principal. He seems like the most unlikely team principal person too. With no prior experience, (laughs) no qualifications. He was just like, I want this. He was like I an engineer, like it, I wanted, I got so he it. kind of has a little bit of experience, but he basically was like, you know what? I'm going to fast track this, and I'm just going to get someone else to buy a team <laughs> for me. For He's this. basically like the it. Lance Stroll of team principles, where yeah. he <laughs> went to, Gene Haas got him to buy the team and install him as the team principal. And so I appreciate that about Gunther, and I appreciate that about Haas. I think Gunther continuously gets the shit beat out of him by <laughs> how horrible his team is. Still, he rises in the words of Lou. Lewis, and I just appreciate that about him. I also think Haas has no pretenses. They're not trying to yeah. be better than they are. They know that they suck. They're not going to ever say they're better than anyone. Or they're like no, the best this season when Gunther was like, "Oh, they're talking about me." That just means that they're jealous. When Haas was like doing well for a little bit, he's like, 
if there's rumors starting about me, that means that I'm doing well. So keep talking. He was like, no press is bad press, baby. <laughs> and then they're like, what if we took sponsorship money from these like tiny boats in like weird houses and we just like take pictures in front of them? They're like, we're not too good to. That was for the beg. Aldi catalog. Yeah. They're like, we're not too good to take some photos for Aldi. <laughs> like it's, Haas is never going to say that they're too good for something. Yeah. And I appreciate them for being self-aware and just being like, we're the shitty team and we're going to do what it takes. But on the other side of that coin is Williams, who needs needs to fess up and quit being in denial about how they suck too but they have a ton of pedigree behind them and actually Mm -hmm. Haas does as well because if you go back in time and look at when it used to be Newman Haas racing especially stateside and things like that there is a lot of background to that brand and to that family name but to your point I mean we're talking at the the bottom of the bottom so what do you think about them potentially becoming someone else you know there's all these rumors about Audi and Porsche and all this Mm -hmm. all, all these musical chairs going on I think that they'll be Haas for at least another couple of seasons until Gene is like, I have absolutely no more money to give to this I have team. nothing <laughs> left to give. Andretti can come buy it. Yeah, and then everyone's gonna say, no. Andretti, you cannot join F1. It doesn't matter, right? Because they got a team, and then they don't have to worry about the money because they don't have drivers, so they yeah. can hire Mario Andretti. We already saw that so at Laguna Seca. Might as well put him in the seat and start at the Andretti franchise that way. Haas is like so dysfunctional, right? I mean, to go beyond what Kate was saying let's go there you know we already talked about he might spin or excuse me Mazda spin Mick Schumacher is on the unemployment line right next to Danny Rick I know Kate and I just talked about that earlier today we recorded our weekly episode and we were just saying not looking good for Mick so in the beginning of the season, yeah, there was a lot of crashing, but he's actually been doing really well. He hasn't done that yeah. that bad. And Gunther basically gave him the ultimatum that said he had to win a race to stay at Haas. And you're like, that, you're like, that's not even possible. Like you're asking him to do the impossible here. But but is it though? Because we speculated about this on several drive through episodes where we said, what if you put Lewis or put Max in the Haas car to prove whether it's the driver's or the chassis okay well look at how lewis has been doing in his current car i do not think that he would do well in the haas at all there's no way there's no way the red bull is like cheater program they've got in it like yeah i think max is and so this is why i think kate and i've talked about this why george is 15 points ahead of lewis is that george came from a shitty car easier to go from shitty to good than good to shitty yeah and so he knows he's like this is an increase like this is 10 times better than what i've been working with so i can work magic on this meanwhile lewis is so used to being ahead and winning he doesn't know how to be in the middle of the pack in a kind of shitty car okay so we'll flip it the other way you put Mick on the test track in a Mercedes and all you need to do is look at his lap times. If he can't qualify at the same level as the current drivers of those cars, then is it the driver or the car? I mean, the proof goes either way. Well, to your point, it's harder to put Max in the Haas because the Haas is basically handicapped compared mm-hmm. to the rest of the, the cars in the fleet. But again, if we flip it the other way on a private testing day and he can't put the numbers down, then he's not qualified to be there. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. And I think that that would be a fantastic way to judge people. Everyone gets the same car. It's how it used to be done. Just and- <laughs> throw it out there. <laughs> Bring it back. Bring it back. We'll start the petition. There's a lot of upheaval. I mean, that's my outlook on the 2022 season with a lot of names disappearing. Mm-hmm. Who's going to be filling those seats? Again, you got Audi and Porsche can't figure out. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, well, P- Porsche played a game that they lost at and now they they're crying and they want back at the table. Audi is committed. I was going to so... say, isn't Audi coming in with uh, Red Bull? Did it, Sauber. That, Sauber. Oh, Sauber. Sauber. Yeah. So in 2026, Sauber, they'll, they'll be here. And I can't wait because now I have to root for Audi and Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> and be busy <laughs> well you'll just have to root for whichever one is doing better exactly whoever's in the lead <laughs> i'm rooting for until they blow up twice the uh chances to root for a number two <laughs> <laughs> again but it's chicanery all over the place because even there some of those petitions have been well we're gonna put stickers on the blah 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 chassis with the honda power plant we're like well is that really a Porsche? Like, yeah, is that right? right? So I think there's a lot of I'm going to I'm going to use a football phrase. It's a rebuilding year. So hopefully <laughs> 23 is a yes. better year for motorsport in general, especially yeah. Formula One. I'm really curious to see how it turns out. Now, granted, I have my sights on the big stage right now because 
Next year is the 100th anniversary of Le Mans. So yeah. I think that's going to eclipse a lot of things. Everybody's talking about the new cars, the new cars, the new cars. Yep. Formula One came out with their new cars this past season. We'll see where that goes. So in listening to your you know, most recent episodes, you were doing the, uh, I guess, the press conference, the drivers, and you all caught Pierre taking a picture of you guys. Did you... <laughs> Happened to get a copy of that picture. And do we know what he was taking a picture of? Yes, we did get confirmation. He was taking his Be Real. And now I don't know if you guys know what Be Real is. It's an app that basically at some time during the day, you get a notification. You have two minutes to take a photo. The story goes, you know, as you heard in the podcast, Kate and I were sitting in the room. I look up. Pierre is taking a photo. We have a bit on our podcast that Pierre is TG1F's number one fan. Mm -hmm. He's liked a handful of our Instagram photos. And this was before the heyday of liked by Pierre Gasly. We were actually also in his Miami GP photo dump as well. And so we're like, Pierre loves us. We were joking that he obviously saw us in the press conference room and had to take a photo of us. <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> You're celebrities to him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he did post his Austin Grand Prix photo dump. Lo and behold, there was the Be Real photo. And there we were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. So we're, we're two for two on USGP photo dumps for Pierre on Instagram. I think he is your number that, one fan. I mean, he what else is there to say? Point. Like, he's not beating the allegations. Yeah, he's not taking pictures of other podcasters. No, is he? no, no, just of us. Not. <laughs> and if he is, he's not putting them in his public photo dump. So <laughs> you guys will be in the next roundup. Promise. Nice. <laughs> so I guess sh shifting gears a little bit. Pun intended. Or... Pun intended. Totally. <laughs> not the Formula One cars have a traditional shifter anymore. They did in my day. <laughs> I walked uphill in both directions of school. Shut too, up, right? boomer. Old man screaming at the clouds. Freaking boomer. I will Please. say, I do wish they still had to use the uh, left foot yeah. for clutch because it would make the races more interesting when someone misses a shift. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of calling on the radio and whining, my shifter box, can you change the program? Now, <laughs> y'all are talking about be reals. Eric doesn't know what MySpace is. <laughs> be real right now. You don't know what MySpace is? <laughs> no, <laughs> he does. Okay, I was like, he jokes, he jokes. We, I was like, we need to have a serious conversation. I just, I just, <laughs> I refuse to do TikTok just like trying to survive. <laughs> That's don't, fair. I don't, don't do go, that. That's don't okay. go down that that yeah, rabbit hole. I don't hole. do TikTok either. Eric's as old fashioned as the rally that he watches. <laughs> <laughs> rally is still a thing. <laughs> is it? it? Not in the U.S. <gasps> when was the last time there was a U.S. rally? That's one of the motorsport series that I want to get into. I want to get into yeah. rally racing. It needs a, it needs a drive to survive. <laughs> it doesn't need if any. Of if that. any motorsport needs a drive to survive, <laughs> it's rally. I will give you the shortcut. It's very simple. <laughs> Download the Red Bull app. They condense everything for you. If you okay. want to watch the long format, you want to get in the car with the drivers, which is super cool to watch them and the navigators doing their thing. Red Bull TV, everything's shot in 8K now. It's like super crystal clear. It is fantastic. Okay, and I will give you one thing. If you want to find a new fan, even though he retired last year and now he's a team principal, go back and watch the in-car footage of Yari Matilatvila. He is known as the madman of WRC for a very good reason. I don't okay. want to spoil it for you. Okay, I'll get into it. It's awesome. Did you get the sense of excitement? I did, and he's sold me on it. So I'm going to go do that, and then I'm going to follow up later. You guys did not sell him on Drive to Survive, <laughs> That's though. okay. I'm going to point That's that okay. out. No offense. You know what? We did our best, and <laughs> maybe one day we'll wear him down. Can't teach an old dog new tricks, you know? <laughs> Zing! <laughs> so speaking of old dogs and new tricks, besides Drive to Survive and all that kind of thing, you know, from your perspective, women in motorsport, what can be done? It, it's been traditionally kind of a boys club, right? The old dogs. How can it be more inviting in your guys' opinion? You, you guys are making it more inviting with your podcast. Well done. Kudos. But I guess outside of that, the greater motorsports industries, what do you think they could do? I mean, I think the first thing is just visibility. And I think there's like, there are a lot of people that are out there that are like, we need more women in F1. We need more women in F1. And I think that that is fair. And we probably do. But I think even more than that, we need just visibility into the women that are already in F1 that are already doing the work that are already have made it there. And we need to kind of uplift those platforms and those women. I mean, the whole thing is visibility. If you can't see it, you can't be 
see it. And like people need to see representation in order to think that they have a chance. And, and you know, not everyone needs that. Some people can just like kind of take the bull by its horns and do it. But there are so many women that are already in F1 in various leadership positions in, in various team positions that I think it's just recognizing them more and seeing them more from the teams. Red Bull has done a good job this year of highlighting Hannah Schmitz. And I think that's been great and huge for people to actually see like recognition for someone in her position. But even press officers, even like heads of communication, Susie Wolf is doing a great job just kind of like being more vocal and, and being more kind of as a figurehead. But I think it's these teams responsibility to showcase the different people that they have on their teams and give them more visibility to people so we can see kind of who's already in in there. So then once we can lift those people up and show their value and their worth and show people what's already going on, then that just kind of opens the door for other people to think, I could do this and I'm going to pursue a career in this and, and try to get in there and have all of the same skills, same qualifications and go in there and say, I'm going to do this as my career too and not really think about it, not give it a second thought. To that point too, around visibility is like getting new fans in, right? Traditionally, like you said, it's been a boys club because I think car are traditionally billed as a boys thing from you know a young age whereas women may get into it later and sometimes it's a little hard to approach because you're later in life and all of these men have already been doing it and and they know all this terminology and you try to ask questions and they make you feel dumb with our spaces like there are no dumb questions doesn't matter what your level is as long as you are willing to answer other people's questions like phenomenal We have people in our community who have interests that range from how the financials work to how the engines work and everything in between. And like, they're willing to answer any single question that anyone has, even if it's just like, why does F1 cost so much money from like the bare bones type of questions and having these spaces where it's easy to ease in to the conversation coming from the female perspective is just very crucial. And I think, you know, F1 continuously putting out new resources about how to get into the sport and find people to connect with is crucial. So do you think the same thing exists as you begin to investigate other motorsports? Kate mentioned MotoGP, you know, we were joking about World Rally. We talked a little bit about sports car racing. There's so many different disciplines to motorsport, whether it's the off-road community, drag racing, etc. So do you see it in the same way as Formula One or have other disciplines made more strides? Honestly, I think that F1 is probably doing the best with women in the sport and as fans. I don't think that we're seeing as much growth in the other areas other than I would say IndyCar is a close second because I think a lot of women feel that IndyCar is also very accessible and it's kind of close to Formula One. That's generally the next path for them. But I would say that all motorsport are facing the same problem is that they're not doing enough to support the female fans and not doing enough to showcase women in leadership or higher roles within the organizations. All very valid points. I do think there's a discipline of motorsport that might actually be doing this better than IndyCar and Formula One, and it's less recognized, although on the big stage, and that's actually sports car racing, because if you look at it, the barrier to entry for female drivers actually, is, a, you're right. yes. is a lot lower. We'll just look at last year's Le Mans with the Iron Dames and all the yes. other females that are running on various teams at different levels from the production-based cars to the prototypes and everything in between. So I think sports car is embracing women without making it apparent. They're just doing it without bringing attention to it. And here's my biggest problem with the open wheel community. It's Formula W, Mm -hmm. right? And as a father of girls, I look at it and go, why can't motorsport be co-ed? Why does a Formula W have to exist? Why aren't these women running alongside of Leclerc and Latifi? I'm sure they're all better than Latifi, you know, and and so on down the line. I don't like that segregation where it's like, it's like the WNBA. Why can't they just play with the men? And I hear the excuses on, I, I call them excuses, the justifications and rationalizations on both sides. But to me in motorsport, motorsport's always been about run what you brung. It doesn't matter who's behind the steering wheel. And I think Formula One, in contrast to what you were saying, is actually behind the curve because Formula W exists. 
No, I would agree with that. And Kate and I have this conversation all the time that like, I can kind of see the justification for the WNBA and the NBA because they're playing on a more physical kind of level. Whereas you're driving the car, the car is not gendered. You do not have to be a certain gender to drive a car. People always ask us about W series and like, if we like it or not. And we're like, well, we appreciate that there is something for women, but we don't appreciate that it is seemingly lower than F3. And it is that there's no direct, no direct pipeline. Yeah. It's seemingly no one wants to support these female drivers. No one wants to give them an opportunity. And so, yes, I a hundred percent agree with you on the fact that that is behind. It's a check the box to say we're being diverse and inclusive. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's across the board with basically all their initiatives (laughs) across diversity. (laughs) And to speak to the sports car world in terms of the path and the growth forward, there is actually a path. Again, they're not doing a good job of advertising it and Mm -hmm. putting in people's faces. But as a female driver, you're listening to this going, well, how do I get out of club racing with SCCA and NASA into the world of of sports car racing? If that's what you like, go to World Challenge. You start in touring car and then you work your way up to GT cars and then so on the line. And then World Challenge is a gateway to IMSA and WEC and, and so on down the line. And so there is a progression path there. But again, they're not, in my opinion, not doing the greatest job of of bringing it out there and saying, hey, look what we've got. Comes back to visibility, right? And like showing people what the options are and showcasing that this is a path forward for men, women, whatever you are. Honestly, that's kind of our hope with the growth of Two Girls, One Formula is that we're expanding outside of just Formula One and showcasing all of the different avenues that are possible for women in the motorsport world. But obviously, Obviously, we cannot do everything all at once. And so it's, it's definitely something we're looking towards the future and helping gain some visibility for our mostly female audience to be like, here are all of the options. It's not just Formula One. If you're interested in cars, like here's how you can get involved. And here's a career path for yeah. you. And one of the things that sort of rubs me the wrong way is when people say, well, when are we going to see the first female Formula One driver? And we even talked about this not too long ago. Tanya brought it up and she's like, that already happened. Right. That yeah, happened in exactly. the 70s. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? That's, I think, where I get frustrated is like, I think there's a lot of people out there. We see a lot of like content creation around like, we need more women and we need a woman to be driving a car. And like, we need to see the first female F1 driver. And like, we need all these things. And it's like, we've been there and we've had these things. So let's celebrate them. Let's talk about them. Let's bring that back into conversation so that more people know that that has happened. And then, because we're talking about it there's seen to be a demand for it Mm -hmm. and that's only going to show people that are in power that there's a demand for it there's a need for it and that people are looking for that to happen again and I think honestly it's just kind of disrespectful to the women that have already been there and have already done the work and have like done these incredible things to say like yeah yeah yeah, you did that but we need another one right now and like we need to be in there and like we need more of this when it's like don't discount what's already happened like don't discount progress that's been made and and even if your hasn't been as good and like maybe it hasn't been like prolonged and the sport hasn't taken hold of it like don't take that away from the people that have Mm -hmm. already had those accomplishments and been the first formula one female driver or been these people that have done these things because to discount those and say that that's not enough is saying that those people are not enough and i think that is like the problem that i have with a lot of the discourse around this Mm -hmm. topic and i think that's where organizations like women in motorsports north america or wimna who you know is headed up by lynn st james and other veteran female racers is setting itself apart from a lot of these other organizations like you're talking about that are maybe a little bit more superficial look at us look at us you know we're, we're starting the trend it's like no the trend was started a long time ago exactly with people like michelle mouton and janet guthrie and, and lynn herself and other people and they're like this is how we need to do this ladies this is how we get the job done and yeah. so i look to those organizations as inspiration hopefully for the future and and that we get the word out there that it exists and that women can go there as a useful resource to building their career in the motorsports industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And and to, I guess, continue this conversation, we've got another pit stop question for you. So of all the successful women that have raced over the years, and we call them the the glorious ladies of racing, are there any on your bucket list that you'd like to meet and talk to, interview with, maybe have as guests on your podcast, you know, things like that? Well, first of all, we'd obviously love to have Jamie Chadwick on the podcast because she has just been the number 
number one champion the past three years in a row for the mm. W series and she's absolutely crushing it. You know, we used to joke that we were gonna get into crypto and start a DAO to buy Haas. With Dogecoin, Brad's got some. Yeah, exactly. From his cyber truck. Uh, Perfect. Alive. We were gonna kick Nikita Mazpin out and instill Jamie Chadwick. This was before he got fired. You would not believe the backlash we received on the internet for this joke. We posted a reel from our podcast where we were talking about this bit and we just got like decimated by like people. death threats of people yeah. being like you are the stupidest people in the world you're so like i can't believe that you're such idiots like you don't even know anything you don't know all the steps you would have to take you can't just buy a team and put someone in there we were <laughs> like have you literally ever heard of a joke <laughs> have you ever looked at the history of any of these formula one drivers I right mean, i was like that's... oh my <laughs> god i yeah like i'm like i'm sorry lance Stoll's dad bought him a team and put him in there so like i think i could probably do that for jamie all right yeah. i'll be her dad <laughs> so we we were and it was just like we had to delete the video because they were just like spreading our they were like we hope they get cancer we hope they die like it was like wow. so yeah. so bad that was a real day to be a woman on the internet <laughs> talking about motorsport but she is one of the leading ladies of the females in motorsport right now and so i think that she would definitely be someone that we would love to talk to because we're eager to help support these women in their journey to become Formula One drivers or, you know, more professional drivers in whatever series they're looking to do. And obviously, you know, we had Danica Patrick, who's, you know, been pretty successful in her career. How can we spread the good word and, and help Jamie get to where she needs to be? I really thought Danica was going to be the next... <laughs> female in formula one not to say the first but the next the next right? yeah. yeah i mean it looked pretty good for her for a while there and then she took that left turn and then she made another left turn <laughs> and another left turn and all and, the left yeah, turns that was um, it she went left 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 yeah i love tony bradinger i think she's really cool and like is bringing a whole new vibe to women in motorsports she's a race car driver but she also like has all of these like beauty brand partnerships and has like worked with like fashion houses and like is just kind of bringing like a new spin to motorsports and saying like I'm a woman that drives a car but that doesn't mean that like I don't care about my hair and my makeup like I can be both and I'm multi-dimensional and I care a lot about what I look like and do all these things but like my job is that I drive race cars and I think she's really cool and is kind of starting a new conversation around that hopefully I think more women that do that will show brands that like they can sponsor women in different ways and it doesn't just have to be like monster energy sponsoring this girl you can be kind of multifaceted as a woman and I'm really excited to start seeing hopefully a diverse set of brands getting into the space of motorsport which is exciting and then obviously we'd love to talk to Susie Wolf like I have to talk to her someday like I have to have her on the <laughs> podcast and I don't even want to talk about Toto I don't I kind of do, but I don't. I want to talk about like her career and like the steps that she's like carved her own path and she's driven F1 cards. Like she's one of the women that have done that. And like, I think she has done a great job of keeping visibility on women. So I'm trying to talk to her. When you were mining your Bitcoin and you're going to buy your team, you're going to put Jamie in the seat. Who else would you put in the seat? You got your team. You got to have two drivers. You got well, two Well, it was still going to be Mick at this point. So we were just going to kick out Mazepin and keep Mick. Well, you're going to do an all-female team. So you got to kick Mick out. Well, so then it was going to be to Tony. Jamie, Jamie and Tony. And Tony. Yeah. 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 But Why not? Why not? So would you guys go totally cliche and you go back to the old Force India livery where they're like all pink or do something different? We did discuss that our car was going to be, we we're going to bring back the bubblegum pink and it was going to be an all pink car. And we were really just going to lean into the girly vibes and we were going to get sponsors like... I got one for you. I got one for you. Okay, tell us. Splayed across the side. Kotex, the best, period. <laughs> okay, Ricky, bye. <Bobby>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tampax. We're really lean into it. Well, it was just going to be the two girls, one formula team. We were going to hypothetically have enough money that we wouldn't need any other sponsors in this fantasy world that we had created. I like yeah. that. <laughs> That's the same thing we do when we have our three car garage fantasy. So, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So it's just going to be Team TG1F, no other sponsors. <laughs> so, ladies, 
we've come to that point in the episode where I like to ask if you have any shout outs, promotions, or anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered thus far. Give us a follow at two girls, one formula on Instagram and TikTok. Unfortunately, it's we're not at two girls, one formula on Twitter because you can't have that many letters in your username. Give us a follow. Check out our podcast if you're at all interested in pop culture side of things. And another plug is that we do have a website, two girls, one formula com where we do sell some pretty fun merch if you're looking for some not team branded formula one merch we always have new collections and also just as a quick aside two girls one formula is spelled t-w-o and then the one is a numerical one there is someone else that has numerical two girls numerical one formula and that's not us but you'll know because they haven't posted in over a year two years <laughs> the two girls one formula community is inclusive welcoming and accepting of all types of fans it doesn't matter if you started watching yesterday or 20 years ago they are here for you to find people to connect with in a meaningful way to learn more about Nicole and Kate and keep up with all things formula one with their unique perspective on this great discipline of motorsports be sure to tune in to their show, Two Girls, One Formula, on all your favorite podcatchers and music apps. You can also find them on social at Two Girls, One Formula. That's Alpha Two Girls, Numeric One Formula on Instagram, TikTok, and visit their website, www.twogirlsoneformula.com. Go for the F1 and stay for the friendships. That's right, Brad. And Kate and Nicole, I can't thank you enough for coming on Break Fix. This has been a lot of fun. We enjoy doing crossovers. I also want to say that we've been very fortunate to have a lot of women on this show, and you guys are joining an elite cast of folks. And what you're doing for the community at large is absolutely amazing. I know it's going to have a positive impact for years to come. And again, I want to celebrate your guys' 50 episodes, and here's to 50 more. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you so for much. having us and all of the kind words. This has been really, really fun. And thank you for being kind to us for not knowing as much about cars as you all do. So thank you for going <laughs> easy on us. <laughs> We're still early in our car journeys. So we'll have to come back on in two years and revisit all of these harder car questions. See if Kate gets a Kia Soul or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We want to know about Monza. That's what we want to know. About. Yeah, we'll circle so back. True. We'll circle back after I reclaim Monza and see where we're at then. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at two zero two six three zero. 1770 or send us an email at crew chief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey everybody, crew chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember... Without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.